Welcome back to The Real Mark Bagwell, a wrestling docu-series. Folks, I have a treat for you today. Go grab the popcorn, sit down. You are in for wrestling folklore. You know, urban legends are real. And I found for you the Mozart, the Pavarotti of wrestling theme songs, the man himself, Howard Helm. Howard, what a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Oh, thanks very much, Jonathan. I appreciate it. You know, you and we'll, we'll talk about your music, uh, life, legacy, and you've gone into so many genres, but you do realize the wrestling theme song fraternity is a very, very small one. There's only a handful of you that have done this. And <laughs> for those of you that have done it, you've done it for a long time. You've recorded over 250 of them yourself with Jimmy Hart. Yeah. So, buddy, in the world of wrestling, you are a living legend. Oh, how kind of you to say. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I tell you this uh, in all seriousness because I've been a lifelong fan of uh, of the sport, wrestling entertainment, uh, sports mm -hmm. entertainment. Uh, Mark Bagwell, Buff Bagwell, and I became friends. We started up this docu-series and talking about his life story. And from the moment I met him and we first started interviewing on my podcast and then making the series, I told him the biggest part of wrestling, one of the biggest is those theme songs. You know, the theme song sets the whole tone for your persona, your character from the moment you walk down and yep. Mark starting off with American males going to the buff daddy theme song. Like he is not buff daddy without the buff daddy theme. And from there, right. you know, doing the research and everything and realizing, uh, no, it was not Jim Johnson. It was Howard Helm and Howard, was, yes. of course, Jimmy Hart and yeah. man, 250 of them. So I got to ask you first and foremost, you didn't start your career in wrestling theme songs. You were already well into the music industry before that. No, I had, uh, yes, I'd been uh, working for, well, I'm originally from Toronto. Hey. So um, there you go. We got a couple of thumbs up there for the Canadian brothers. Um, I'm still here. Brother. I had been working you know, with, with several bands since the mid seventies. You know, the first band I was in out of Toronto was called Zon. Um, the second band I was in in the eighties was called Refugee. And then um, at the end of the 80s, I went out with uh, Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson. And, uh, you know, two British guys, for the, those that are not old enough to remember, Ian Hunter used to be the lead singer for Mott the Hoople. And uh, Mick, Mick Ronson, of course, was David Bowie's original guitar player in The Spiders from Mars. So it just, uh, I mean, for me, a couple of British legends, for sure, it was a huge career opportunity. And I spent four years with them until uh, Mick got uh, sick and Mick passed in 93. Um, too bad, because we, sh I mean, not only did I just love, I mean, those guys, they were great, great guys. Um, but uh, just, we were on a great, we were on a great roll. The band was really good. And it just, it was so sad, you know, when uh, I, I, none of us had any idea how sick Mick was. Anyway, make a long story short, here I am, I'm running around the world now at this point, and um, <clears throat> as happens, I met a girl, my ex-wife, from the Tampa Bay area, and so what happened was, um, when I was out on the road running all over the world with Ian and Mick, um, you know, I just, I realized, I go, you know, it doesn't really matter where I live. And I must admit, the last few winters that I was in Toronto, I mean, I was pretty much at the end of my rope with winter. I just, I'm just one of those guys who, you know, you miss, you miss that last bus leaving the subway station at two o'clock in the morning, and there's a blizzard outside, and it's, you know, minus ten out, and you got to, it. I just, I'm, I'll never forget it. There was a night. I mean, I was walking up. I'd missed the bus. I'm walking up the hill. I'd been downtown. And I'm going, and I was headed home. And I mean, I, I just thought I was going to freeze my butt off by the time I got to the house. And I'm just, you know, oh, I've got to get out of here. So fast forward, I got myself out of there. I uh, figured out, hey, the beach in Florida sounds good to me. Uh, of course, a little bit of a reaction the other way when you realize what, what summer's like there. Um, anyway, that's what happened. And I, um, so I had was still touring when I, when I uh, moved to Tampa. And then, um, uh, like I said, when the Ian's band went off the road, I kind of thought, hmm, this is kind of interesting. Now I'm in a I'm in a market that I had never worked in. I used to tell people in Tampa, it's like it's like when I go to work, I go to the airport. I mean, it's all it's like the wrestling guys. When they go to work, they go to the airport. Right. And of course, with there being so many, I used to be a huge fan of wrestling back 
used to go see the Sunday night things at Maple Leaf Gardens. I mean, I I loved it. Are you kidding me? You know, the Iron Sheik and all, oh, gee, I just love that stuff. And so anyways, when I, um, <clears throat> so I started looking around locally in Tampa for, um, uh, for some work. To, it was the 90s, a lot of grunge coming in. There wasn't a lot of touring going on, especially for a keyboard player. Uh, you know, the 80s thing was, was moving away. And uh, so anyway, uh, I met two brothers that owned a recording studio called Morris Sound, Jim and Tom Morris. And uh, it was, I mean, it was actually kind of a, a no brainer that I would meet them because it was the best studio in town. It's, it's, it's uh, near the USF campus. Um, and they just, it was the only really pro studio, you know, two SSL rooms. I mean, it was like the kind of stuff that I'd been used to recording with the bands that I had been recording with. I went, okay, this is a, finally a real studio. Well, this was the end of, uh, let's see, this would have been in 93. Um, anyway, the first project I did there was with uh, violinist Robbie Steinhardt from Kansas. And um, that's how I met the Morris Brothers. They, uh, the guitar player that was working on that project, actually, I think was a friend of my, my ex-brother-in-law. Somehow we we met I don't remember but he was like hey if you're in town he says I've got this new project that's going on that's that's really you know with a guy from Kansas and it's like you know, I said hey I said are you kidding that's right up my alley so um that's what happened I ended up getting together going down to more sound and working on that album um and I guess I must have caught the attention of the Morris brothers because they you know it was not long after that I got a phone call going hey uh are you like actually living here and staying here now? And I said, yeah, well, yeah. And they said, well, you know, we really could use a guy like you at our studio. I mean, we, you know, we, we have a guy that's in an offline room and he's, you know, he's there basically for, you know, whatever you might need that a keyboard player can do. And of course the thing is with all the stuff now with all the computers and everything, I mean, um, I, I can do a lot of different things. Like, for instance, it's really weird. I've got a bunch of credits on a bunch of heavy metal albums. But what I'm doing on heavy metal albums nine times out of ten are these big sort of bombastic intros with choirs and strings and stuff. And then, you know, in comes the guitars. And then Howard's gone. And so... Uh, it was really, really interesting. While I started, anyways, I took the job there. I said, hey, this sounds great. You know, puts me, you know, they were doing all sorts of different stuff. Warren had just done an album there at the studio. And um, uh, um, anyway, then in the next studio is where Hulk was. Hulk was recording his album, The Wrestling Boot Band. It was exactly the same time. I mean, I just started there. And, uh, and Jimmy, I had not met Jimmy. But of course, you know, you know, Jimmy, I mean, he's just Jimmy flying around everywhere. So, yep. So I saw him one day coming through the lounge. I was coming out of my office, which is on the opposite side of the two studio rooms. And I'm, I mean, I just went right the mouth of the south. He turns and go, I said, no, you don't know me. I said, but I sure know who you are. And we got talking and the rest of it. He came and stuck his head in my office and, you know, saw the keyboards and the, and the, the computer and all the stuff in there. And he says, Oh, he says, you know, what do you do in here? And I sort of explained it. I said, well, I do, you know, there's some soundtrack stuff and, and, and I'll do demos for people. Sometimes if there's writers in a band, um, instead of burning up the clock in the main studio, if they've got a new song, a lot of times they come across to my office and we'd be able to flesh out all the parts and just get things in a rough thing and then take it back to the band and the band to be able to go ahead and finish it but you know because obviously just working with me it was at a lower rate so anyway that's what happened i listened to a little bit of uh, uh what was going on and with the wrestling boot band and i you know i thought well this is pretty cool you know i met hulk that day and it was kind of like you know okay and then all of a sudden that's where it started jimmy i want to say hmm, maybe a week or two later called me and said uh you know, there might be something you might be interested in. And I said, well, you know, what's that? And he goes, well, he says, I, you know, I'm, I work doing music for, for a lot of these guys when they come out to the ring. I said, oh, okay. I said, uh, he says, I've been working with different people. And he, he said, one of the things that's been really inconvenient for me is that they're all, they're all out of town. Nobody's in Tampa. He said, I, you know, he says, it really would be nice if I had somebody at home, 
you know what I mean, that I could work with because it's just the nature of the business. And boy, once we got into it, did I ever find out, you know, why it's a good thing that, that, you know, somebody's right there. I mean, we used to get last minute phone calls and that was the reason really why the WCW um, became so fond of, of what Jimmy and I were doing because, because Jimmy's on every broadcast. So you got to figure if you're okay. So if you're a wrestler and, and you got this crazy idea, I want a thing that sort of this sort of thing to come out to, to the ring, but I want to come out to to the ring tomorrow night. It's like, Oh yeah. Well, how's this going to, well, you know what? We could make it happen because I get the old panic phone call from Jimmy, you know, Howard, we got, we got something, we got to turn around fast. I said, okay. And so we get it and we, you know, we get together, boom, pop the thing out that night in the studio. Jimmy would take either a dat or ultimately ended up taking CDs after a while when that became much more common. And I mean, you got to figure he's on a plane the next morning, boom he's at the, he's at the broadcast he walks into the truck he hands them a thing he says when so and so is coming out this is his music tonight and the wrestlers loved it they went oh my god this is great i can you mean i can just like basically and they all next thing you know that's how it happened everybody started going to jimmy at the broadcasts and saying hey jimmy you know you and you and your friend in tampa there can you put this together put this together and that and it's funny, you know, one of the ones that I enjoyed the most was Buff Bagwell's theme, because it, it it's what I call a real theme. It's it was written specifically, you know what I mean, it, with with the ideas, you know, from Mark and just like just, you know, and that's all the thing, you know, um, the wrestlers had a lot of input in this. I mean, not every one of them. But I'll tell you, I met most of them because they would come down to the studio and they wanted to see what we were doing. And they would just they'd have little suggestions. And and then things really got out of hand, you know, after a bunch of years there, we started getting near the end. You know, things like trying to teach wrestlers how to sing. Holy mackerel. That was like, you know. A lot of them can barely yeah, Kurt talk. Kurt Hennig comes to mind. We worked on Kurt Hennig and and, uh, and I, we worked on, uh, we were working rap on, well. Rap is crap. Rap is crap. <laughs> rap is crap. I'll tell you what, man. And it's just like, I'll t- I had I had such a huge smile on my face the whole time we were doing that. And I remember going across the hall to the main studio room to record Kurt's vocal. And I could see the edge of the air. I mean, you know, the thing is, I'm coming in. Jimmy and I come in, sort of like the producers, right? We commanded Kurtz out there, and and the engineer's looking at me like, what the hell is this? Isn't this guy a wrestler? I said, yeah, and he's going to sing a song for you. So, you know, that's how it started. So I'd let's say the first one, I want to say one of the first ones I did was for Randy Savage, the... um, uh, Pop and Circumstance uh, remake? uh, uh, it was the, it was the, oh, it was the one that was like the, uh, um, it did, it, it wasn't the last one. That What Up Mott was the last one he used. It was before that, whatever the one was before. It was kind of a Hendrixy thing. Um, I can't remember. Well, he also now, made, he, he made an album at one point as well. This and Hulk Hogan, mm-hmm. he created his own rap album, which was, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Every, but Hulk did one I too. I didn't so. have anything to do with that. <laughs> So I, I do have a list in order here. I'm telling you right now, by yep. the way, wrestling fans are listening to this worldwide. They're on the edge of their seats. I can tell you I am because I've been dying to know all this kind of information. For some mm-hmm. reason, the internet does not have it. Now we're giving it to the internet in full, uh, unfiltered. There's a step-by-step. So I'm going to tease them a little bit before we jump into Buff Daddy's theme song, the wrestling mm-hmm. theme songs. And I ask you first and foremost, how did you, as far as in, how early in your life did you get into music? Did you know from a young age you were go- that was going to be your profession? How soon did you know? Was it high school, grade school? Like when did, was music your thing? You know, it's it's a that's a great question because I am one of those uh, sort of anomalies in the world. Um, my mother was a piano teacher, so the Mine first too. time I sat, yeah, yeah. So first time I sat down on the piano, I was four. And um, 
it was really funny. I just, you know, just, I was always curious. I watched my mom play and then it'd be like, okay, I want to anyway, uh, started chugging along in that. And it's funny, just like Billy Joel. I remember seeing this in an interview once when the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan in 1964, I, sitting in the living room cross-legged in front of the tv my family's behind me i basically i basically just said to everybody just be quiet when these you know and then they're all like what is this thing he wants to watch i'm sitting there i am glued in front of the 19 inch black and white dumont tv and i'm like glued by the time it got to the end of the thing in my mind i went i'm gonna do that i'm gonna find a way to take what I learned on the, on the piano and I'm going to find a way to, to get out there. And you know what? I was really, really, um, I was really lucky. I had a lot of encouragement through school. Uh, by the time I got to junior high, um, I was actually, I, I guess I, but at that point had already become a reasonably accomplished piano player. And, uh, because they were teaching beginning band and stuff like that, the teacher goes, Oh my goodness, what are we going to do with, with Howard? It's like, he's going to be bored out of his mind in this. I don't want him to just quit. So we, uh, that first year, there was a, a group came down from the high school and uh, like a jazz band thing. And they played and that really caught my attention and went, well, this is really cool. I said, so the music teacher says to me, he goes, well, did you like that? I said, oh, I like that. I said, that'd be cool. He goes, well, he says, we call that a stage band. He said, that's the, 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 the formal name for it. He says, there's one in the high school when you get up there. He says, if you want to start messing around with it here, he said, it might be a little difficult because the kids are just learning and the rest of it. So he used to, to, he used to let me in grade seven, he would give me piano scores and stuff like that. And I would sit in his office where, that had a glass window so he could see me. While he's teaching the kids, here's a C, here's how you read music and the rest of it. He tasked me with making arrangements for jazz band from the piano scores. So I was like, he told me how to do the transpositions. I'd score out trumpet parts, sax parts and everything. This is in grade seven. And so this, you know, this, so junior high, things kept chugging along. I guess somebody at the high school knew I was coming because as soon as I was first year in the high school freshman first thing they did the, the guy who'd been leading the uh uh the jazz band uh had graduated and so uh, this you know these things happened to me anyways they put me in charge of the jazz band in grade 10 i mean a freshman in charge of the jazz band with all these seniors sitting there i mean they must have thought what the heck is going on have they lost their minds well that was that really got it going. I mean, I got really excited with that. And then I started, you know, of course, not only doing that because I played in every music group that was in the high school. And I mean, it was and it was an exceptional um, orchestra. We actually went to London and Paris that year, uh, the first year and, and played. And uh, we won the Kiwanis Festival every year for so many years that people just started going, hey, if Victoria Park's in it, we're not we're not entering. We're not even going to bother because nobody can touch them. We actually were the orchestra that was um, in the first scene of a movie called Class of 44, which was the sequel to Summer of 42 with Gary Grimes and uh, and that. We're the, the actual Victoria Park Orchestra is at the graduation ceremony at the front of the movie. They called us in the middle of the summer, said, hey, can you guys come down? We'll pay you to cut your hair. You know, we need a school orchestra playing for the graduation ceremony. And uh it's just amazing. I just, you know, I stuck my nose in everywhere I could. You know, I started playing in bands probably when I was 15, you know, and just most of the guys were much older than me. Um, it was it was tricky, you know, but uh, Toronto, I have told so many people my whole life, Toronto was one of the great, great music cities to grow up in. Um, it just from the 70s and sometimes I feel like I was actually a little too young because I was about four years behind that whole generation that was down in Yorkville, you know, where, uh, you know, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and, and Bruce Colbert and Gordon Lightfoot and, you know, where everybody was hanging, the hippies are hanging out and the rest of it. I was I was still in junior high in those years, but boy, I was following the bands and the band. It was really funny. So the band. Hopefully I'm not wandering too much. No, no. So the band that uh, 
Uh, I ended up playing it in high school. Um, uh, it was a band called Faust, not like the one that's out now. Um, anyways, a uh, couple of guys from a neighboring high school and then me and uh, the guitar player that was in that band actually ended up being the guitar player in Zon later on. Um, we were, we, you know, but uh, we, um, we had a practice hall in, I want to say it might have been Ajax. Back then, Ajax would have been a long way out from the city. It was, a, it was an industrial thing. And um, there was a band that sort of had, uh, they permanently set themselves up at the end of the hall is their practice room. There's about six practice rooms in this, in this factory, the, the warehouse thing, right? right? And they painted the door. It was Rush. So Rush used to practice down the end of the hall in the same place and the rest of it. And so, I mean, you know, I, it's just, it was amazing. I mean, I tell people, I go, I mean, my God, Rush played our high school. I mean, it's like, people go, what? I said, yeah. I said, they, I said, they played, they played all Zeppelin stuff. I said, Ze Getty was the only guy who could sing as high as Robert Plant. He didn't sound like Robert Plant, but he could sing as high as he could. And I said, they, that's what they used to do. I remember their first album coming out. I saw them at the gas works. They got all this new equipment. I mean, you know, I was really into the whole Toronto thing. And, um, you know, the, all the bands from there. I mean, the international audience listening to this might not know who some of the bands were. But, you know, you got to figure your Rush and, and Triumph and Max Webster and, uh, you know, Gatto. And, you know, just... It was just an amazing pool of talent that was around in Toronto, you know, and uh, so just like a lot of other kids, I, you know, I got the I got the bug and um, man, it ended up being my whole life. It ended up being everything I've ever done. I'm one of the few people you meet these days who I have never done anything in my life except music. And I, I mean, I've been very blessed. I got to tell you, it's, it, it, it sends chills down my spine because when I said Mozart, you know, I wasn't that far off because you were born to do what you're doing. You're living your chosen yeah. life and yeah. you knew it from a young age. You stuck to it and it was a, diver a diverse career. It's still going. But uh, mm -hmm. before we again, we get before we get into wrestling theme songs, I know people are dying to hear it because I promise it to them. But uh, from your diversity, you know, you hear you said rock music, uh, heavy metal. But I, I, I scanning your, your works, meditation music children's mm -hmm. albums you crossed over to a few different genres i have never heard that before how does one go from doing heavy metal on one hand to meditation on the other you know it's one of those things where um that's why the studio job was ideal for me because um a lot of times you'll find a lot of musicians want to do everything in one particular genre um i guess to be honest with you that was one of the difficulties i was having um, in the later 80s in Toronto is that I had gotten to the point where I was so well known in the Toronto music community, but all anybody would ever think of me is either the keyboard player for Zon or the keyboard player for Refugee. It's like, it's, it's like no matter what I did, no matter what studios, no matter what jobs, other little things, jingles, anything I go looking for, I had a real problem getting work other than the rock work, you know? And I thought to myself, well, you know, I, I had studied all these things. Of course, the orchestra thing I was telling you about in high school, I was a French horn player. So I mean, my, you know, and I was pretty well versed in classical music and that was interesting too. I also sang in a professional children's choir when I was uh, 12, I think, something like that. It's called Young Canadian Singers. And um, I, remember, I remember one time we actually did some concert that involved the children's choir with the TSO at Massey Hall I mean it was it was uh so I've always had you know what I mean exposure to things you know what I mean little things here and there you know I just uh when Zon split up I it was too bad and it was really I you know I I didn't know what the heck I was going to do I'm in my 20s I'm thinking about you know I actually ended up playing in a a band that did um <laughs> you know love this it was a it was a 10-piece band and there were only two white guys in the band, me and the drummer. Figure that one out, me and the drummer. And we did all like Earth, Wind and & Fire and Atlantic Star and all this stuff. I mean, a complete genre change for me. 
I absolutely loved it. We actually ended up doing like some Herbie Hancock and things like that. I was also, yeah, I know, yeah, I forgot to mention that too. I was also big time into jazz when I was in my teens. Um, yeah, I used to sneak into some places downtown. I saw, um, I saw Chuck Mangione the first time he played the Colonial Tavern on Young Street. Um, and I was definitely not old enough to be in there. Snuck in with a friend of mine and we sat up in the balcony right over the stage and, and watched. The drummer in the band was Steve Gadd. The bass player was Tony Levin. They were both still in school. They were in school in Rochester, right? And the band came up because they were all at school together. And who, you know, I mean, that, you're talking about now world legends as far as rhythm section. I saw them play in Toronto and in school. The horn band Chase, um, that used to be a little more aggressive than uh, the Chicago stuff and that. I saw them at the Colonial the night before half of them died. They took a plane from Toronto. They were flying back to someplace in northern New York State. Plane went down over the lake. Saw the last show they ever played. And it was just jaw-droppingly good. It was just, you know. So, I mean, that's my, that's my, you know, that's my whole thing. It's just, I've always had influences from everything, you know. I've done reggae sessions. I mean, I remember play, doing a session with this cousin of, of Jimmy Cliff's. Man, I'm sitting in there on the organ. It's like you can't see the other side of the of the of the cutting room where the band is. I mean, for the weed smoke, it's just it's unbelievable. I mean, there's just the spliffs are going constantly with these guys, and I'm over there on the organ, like dee, 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 just having a good old. Time. But you know what? The session went well. You know, more than once I've had a couple of black guys come up to me and go, "Man." I close my eyes. It's hard to believe you're a white man. <laughs> so, it means you got soul, I brother. Think, hey, yeah, I said, you know what? I took that as a compliment every time. You know, I beg your pardon. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So you're interrupting my. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we have, know, a, we have an entrant in our uh, episode no, that's here. All right. <laughs> so good, good segue to as far as your diversity of work. Then coming to wrestling theme songs. So right. As luck will have it, you know, I, I channeled you, I found you, we set the the, uh, the date we're going to have this broadcast, you and I are going to meet, talk about your life and career in wrestling. Mm -hmm. Who's showing up in Toronto the weekend before, but Jimmy Hart. So Jimmy Hart. happens. Jimmy Hart, as luck will have it. Somebody messaged me, I said, you got to be kidding me. I just spoke to Howard, Howard's coming on the show next week. And Jimmy is showing up in Toronto out of nowhere, yeah. appearing at a snack shop, an opening of a snack shop. They have exotic snacks, and Jimmy's going to be there on a Saturday. So Really? Absolutely. I didn't know what the event was. I, I mean, you know, I know Opening of a snack shop. I thought it was a shawarma stand. A snack shop. So Jimmy is there at the snack shop. So oh, I show wow. up there, and I meet Jimmy in person. Jimmy's hair is a natural dark black, looks great. He's got the shades on, full of energy. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. How you doing, baby? You know, he's all excited, right? And as we start to talk, uh, I came in a good timing. Uh, not that many people there yet. Some people just left. After I left, they got busy. But we had a good amount of time to talk. And I told him the story of how you were coming on the broadcast. His eyes got bigger than saucers. You got to tell Howard. I said, hello. I got to see Howard. Tell Howard to call me. I got to talk <laughs> to Howard. He was like... I, I promised him that I was going to tell you. So I have video footage. <laughs> Jimmy, I told Howard to call. And so yeah. Jim, Jimmy tells to me, hold on, hold on. So he starts going through his phone, right? And there's a lot of messages on the phone I could see. And then, see, there's Hulk. Hulk messages me. I talked to Hulk. Like they're best friends, right? So he's all excited oh, about yeah, Hulk. Yeah, they are best friends. Does not say Hulk Hogan on his contacts. It says Hulk. So Hulk was texting him that morning. Hulk is good. What did Jimmy want to show me? He wanted to show me the Spotify downloads of all the music that he had saved a screenshot of that you and him had written together. And mm -hmm. man, it was an extensive list. And the number one most downloaded downloaded wrestling theme song that Jimmy Hart and Howard Helm had done is? I'd probably guess the Wolfpack. You would be guessing correctly with 2.7 million downloads. Yeah. So, so Jimmy wants to talk to you about that, by the way, because he says there's a lot of downloads and you guys have to talk about it. But it was a very impressive list. Uh, it's interesting. His number one that Jimmy Hart had ever done, I don't know as far as from his life and career, but before coming to WCW, what would you guess is the number one wrestling theme song or would you know of Jimmy's biggest wrestling theme songs? Um, 
Well, I always think that Hulk was with the biggest, so I would think American Made. Uh, he did not do American. Not I, I believe that was Jimmy Johnson. Yeah. So the lyrics, if you recall them, I think I'm cute. I know I'm sexy. I got the look that drives the girls wild. I got the moves that really move them. I said chills up and down their spine. I'm just a sexy boy. Sexy boy. Oh, that's the Shawn Michaels yeah, theme song. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Shawn okay. Michaels theme song was downloaded on Spotify. If I'm not mistaken, it was 12 or 15 million. Like, holy, that's a great song. Wow. Yeah. But like that song has been played ad nauseum and we never get sick of that one. Love it. I can tell yeah. you when I, when I work out of my gym in Vaughn, Ontario, we have a playlist. We put the wrestling theme songs and we go to town with it. And if that doesn't pump you up to weight lift, I don't know what will. But yeah, that's yeah, right. So Jimmy was very, very proud of the uh, downloads, wanted to say, and he would not stop talking about you. He loves you to death, says he misses you. You guys talked when you were last in Florida, but he says, yeah. Howard, give him a call. That's the connection and the brotherhood, because how many years were you guys working together for? Um, we worked from 94 to, well, 94 is when we started. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we kept Jimmy, you know, we kept trying to do things after the, the WCW thing, you know, got bought by wwe right which um without without going into too much of it it was it was not that there were a lot of issues that happened there um in in particular you know um my opinion is that really vince just wanted to shut wcw down that was really that's really what i think was the root of it and um what they tried to do with the music, and this is this is this is where it gets really complicated, and and quite honestly has very much affected um, what Jimmy and I have been able to earn off the the stuff. Um, they bought like the rights and 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 everything to everything. It was WCW, of course. You know, you're a lawyer. You you know, you know the stuff. So it's like the, but they didn't. They didn't buy it all. They somehow like they left the publishing somehow with with Turner's publishing company, which makes absolutely no sense at all. And so what happens is you've got this music that that the, the, the broadcasting of it and the rest of it. There's no logical uh, paper trail and, and, and uh, of, of of people that should be paid. And WWE, since whatever the heck it was, it was spring of 2001, I think, that WCW went off the air. I remember watching the last broadcast. Um, and I just was so, I was just so disappointed. And then it was just like, they just carted it off. And uh, Jimmy and I have tried several times over the last, whatever, 25 years to um, to try and sort some of this out. And it's, it's, um, it's pretty impossible. I mean, the bottom line is any of the music attorneys that I've spoken to have said, Howard, you're talking about really expensive litigation, like like a company like WWE. My God, they could drag this thing out, you know, until you're an old man and you're just going to end up spending all this money on legal fees instead of getting a check, which is what you're really trying to get. And uh, so the stuff's been up in limbo for a long time. I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. Don't want to dwell too much on this because the fans hear about it and, and it gets weird. You know, they, some people start getting really pissed off. Um, and, uh, and that not at us. I'm mean, talking about like basically sure. at, you know, like I'll give you an example Please. and then we'll kind of move on to another subject. Mm -hmm. The WCW mayhem album that came out. Okay. Last numbers I saw on that was that it sold about 300,000 copies, I think, in the U.S. It might, it may be a little more now, but the fans were furious when I found out what they were doing with that album. I mean, Jimmy and I had no idea. There's seven songs of ours that are on that album. Jimmy and I have never seen five cents from that CD. 300,000 copies, and we had seven songs on that CD. Where's the writer's royalties? And like I said, it's not that it's not that I don't have a, a case. It's just, like I said, there's been two attorneys I've spoken to. And both attorneys said to me, oh, brother, this is just, this is, this is bad. It's like, you know, 
I just don't know how we're getting, you know, how, we're, how we're going to go after these guys, you know, it's, it's, you know, and so unfortunately it's been left that way. You know, it's just that, that Jimmy and I have never been properly reimbursed for much of the music that's out. Um, and I don't even know what the status of stuff really is from even the sales, like off Apple music and stuff. Now, I mean, people are downloading it. There's four, you know, right. And, and where's the, where's, where's the writer's royalties? You know I had I mean? no That's idea the- before we, we connected of what was going on. I just know oh, yeah. we're playing it on Spotify, Apple music. It's getting yeah. downloaded. 2.7 million people uh, downloaded right. the Wolfpack song. Money is being exchanged hands. Where's the money? Well, know, the money, the only place it can be is it's got to be with the WWE. You would think, but... The uh, w- and the WWE, basically, their whole attitude is like, hey, you guys have nothing to do with us. We don't owe you anything. Which is such a shame, you know. And I agree with you on your thoughts of what happened to WCW because, you know, if it was done properly and it was being bought, what I would have done with it, I would have kept it as a separate brand altogether, mm-hmm. have a quasi competition. Like when you have telecoms, for example, here in Canada, you have Rogers mm-hmm. and you have Fido. Fido used mm-hmm. to be a separate company. Rogers bought them up, run it as a separate company. Oh, there's an alternative. You don't want Rogers? Go to Fido. Like, you know, in the States, you know, with uh, other telecoms own each other, they, ca- they carry it under separate brands, but it's really the same company. So go to one or go to the other. They're getting paid regardless. Right. Run a separate wrestling promotion. There's plenty of wrestlers to go around have competition between the promotions, maybe bring people back and forth. They're going to be so much done with it. But Vince said, you try to show me up. You try to bury me. It's like buying yeah. an art. It's like buying an art gallery, taking the paintings, throwing them in a basement, in a locker somewhere yeah. and never seeing them again. And it's such a shame because even, you know, you're talking about the music and you're talking about the video rights to it and the broadcast of that. Mm-hmm. And the wrestlers involved, like we'll be talking about Mark Bagwell shortly, but think about wrestlers like Mark Bagwell that were lifer WCW wrestlers got screwed because they said, you know what? You're a WCW person. Guess what? You're fired. Get out of here. We don't need oh, you anymore. Oh, they were, they were horrible with the wrestlers, Jonathan. They were horrible. They, they, they all got treated as badly as Jimmy, Jimmy and I did. I just couldn't believe it. You were absolutely right. Vince could have gotten way wealthier. If he had just run WCW as a separate thing, and he could have come up with so many stories of things going between the two. I mean, my goodness, it, it would have written itself. Howard, you know, so, it's it so different been... that if I don't if I don't like you, Howard, and I buy your house just to tear it down, just yep. to spite you, but yep. I've just thrown money, I've just I've just well, I've thrown away money, good money for no reason, mm-hmm. just for spite, and that's really yep. for spite.